And the uh, new speaker now is Dr. Mercedes Martinez. She's a associated professor of pediatrics, a medical director of intestinal transplant from New York. Welcome, Dr. Welcome, Dr. Mercedes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me again this morning. Um, I'm going to talk about recurrence of liver disease after transplantation, kind of um, a difficult topic. Any adult gastroenterologist in the audience? Okay, I have some slides for you. <laughs> then when I prepare, I didn't know whether many adults will be here. Then the objective of my topic is recognize disease recurrence after liver transplantation, understand the impact of the recurrence on the graph and patient's outcome, and discuss management and future directions. Uh, what is a recurrent disease? Uh, we define recurrent disease when we have allograft dysfunction in the presence of clinical signs or symptoms that support the diagnosis of the primary disease. The disease that uh, was um, the one that uh, was indi uh, the indication for the liver transplant. And then we look at serological, radiological, bi virological, and histological features confirming this diagnosis. And in most cases, we need to exclude um, uh, rejection, acute cellular rejection. What are the frequent uh, recurrence uh, disease? Malignancy, um, viral infections, hepatitis C and B, um, recur lifestyle that cause the original disease, like alcoholic liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Genetic disorders like progressive familiar intrahepatic cholestasis, type one and two. Um, because there was so much discussion before me about these two disorders, I exclude them uh, to save some time. I exclude uh, the PFIC, but I will be willing to, in the discussion, talk about the management of this patient. Um, autoimmune disorders like a primary biliary cholangitis, it's not primary biliary cirrhosis anymore. PSC and autoimmune hepatitis. Most of the focus of my lecture will be the autoimmune disorders. I think that they are the ones more relevant for the pediatric um, audience. Malignancy. Um, the prognosis and the recurrence of malignancy depends on the histological type and the extension of the original tumor. We know that there are excellent outcomes after carcinoid tumors and selective neuroendocrine tumor. Um, but, and most, these tumors most of the time don't recur, even when they are very large. Uh, but there is poor survival after cholangiocarcinoma, colon cancer metastasis. And there was a trend many years ago that if you have a colon cancer metastasis, you get that uh, um, part of the liver resected. There is a lot of recurrence of that. And we uh, know that cholangiocarcinoma is lethal most of the time. And there are few centers in the world that will do liver transplant for this disease, given the bad outcome. More relevant to pediatric population, uh, variable outcome after transplantation for HCC and hepatoblastoma. These are the two tumors that we see in pediatric. For HCC, Milan versus San Francisco criteria um, is a big debate in the adult population. I want to emphasize here that in the pediatric population, we don't follow this criteria. We actually have transplanted pediatric patients with very large hepatocellular carcinoma as long as the tumor is limited to the liver. When there are extra hepatic disease, we don't transplant those patients. Different from hepatoblastoma, that even when they have extra hepatic disease, if the extra hepatic disease, mainly pulmonary uh, meds, can be um, temporized or controlled um, or treated before the transplant, we do consider patients uh, with hepatocellular carcinoma for transplantation. What about viral hepatitis? Just briefly, hepatitis C, we know there is a universal recurrence if the patient has circulating, circulating viruses at the time of transplant. Those, that means if the patient has a PCR positive, your patient will get the hepatitis C back, period. Um, this has been very difficult in the past, but now with the outcome of the new antivirals, this has changed the paradigm. And Patients get transplanted, but they get treated after the transplant. The disease will come back, but the treatment is done so fast immediately after transplant that this don't constitute a problem anymore. Hepatitis B, again, before we use immunoglobulin and nucleoside and nucleotides analogs, there was universal recurrence. Now we can control uh, the disease after the transplant. Lifestyle. The risk of alcohol abuse after liver transplantation varies from 15 to 30 percent. 
then these patients, if they drink again, the disease will come back. Esteatosis is present in 40 to 60% of liver allograft, and this is something that is going to grow because obesity and the lifestyle issues of the modern era are bringing us to this uh, epidemic. Um, up to 5% of the graph, the graph will be lost due to nafeldid and uh, cryptogenic cirrhosis uh, after transplant. Then it's very important to consider social and family support, increased awareness to prevent these lifestyle problems to recur after the liver transplant. Then let's focus now on the autoimmune liver disease that is the focus of our topic this morning. Autoimmune liver disease can progress uh, to NHT liver disease and by, it requires liver transplantation um, in many patients. It's the third most common indication for transplantation in the world this day. The first one has been hepatitis C and this is uh, coming down um, with the liver cancers, then obesity and now autoimmune liver disease. Despite the excellent outcome of liver transplantation, recurrent disease is still a problem uh, for patients with autoimmune liver disease it's not clear the diagnosis. We just have a discussion this morning and one of the patients that I, I shared with a previous speaker and the patient came back to me and she was transplanted for autoimmune hepatitis and she came with allograft dysfunction and despite an extensive workup, I was not able to tell her whether she has recurrent disease or, um, or rejection. The first diagnosis is always rejection. When you have a transplant patient and the liver tests are abnormal, the first thing that you think that is rejection. And rejection do occur more often in patients with autoimmune liver disease. Uh, then these patients get over immunosuppressed and get more immunosuppression than others. But really it's a lack of biomarkers for the diagnosis of autoimmune liver disease. And it's up to us as a community to try to uh, solve this problem. Uh, what is the clinical presentation? Uh, for autoimmune hepatitis, it's a progressive inflammatory process serological characterized by elevation of liver enzymes, hypergamma globulinemia, and a specific autoantibodies. Histologically, we are going to see interface hepatitis um, with lymphoplasmocytic infiltrate, and, and most exclude other possible viral and metabolic etiologies. Again, it's not a straightforward diagnosis. And is frequent, sometimes present from asymptomatic, the patient has nothing, and you check liver tests for any other reason, the liver tests are elevated, you do the workup, you make the diagnosis. Sometimes patients present with cirrhosis and sometimes with fulminant liver failure. Then you really don't know when are you going to find this patient. You need to be aware that they can present and look for this. There are non-specific symptoms. The progression to cirrhosis is from 10 to 40%, and it's the six per represents 6% of all the liver transplant in North America. There are two types type 1 and type 2 based on the presence of those antibodies. And then this is how you diagnose autoimmune hepatitis. Um, I know that you are going to laugh, most of you have never seen this, and the ones that have seen this most likely will not use it, because it's very cumbersome when you have a patient in front of you to go through check mark, check mark. This is mainly used for research. There is a more uh, simplified and advanced um, uh, classification for uh, autoimmune criteria for autoimmune hepatitis that was developed more recently, and more people are using this for uh, clinical um, indication. But it's basically the same, based on the antibodies, the IgG, the histology, and the absence of viral hepatitis. How do we diagnose recurrent hepatitis, uh, uh, autoimmune hepatitis? Is variable in frequency. Liver transplant is the confirmed diagnosis for. Uh, the, the indication for the first transplant. There are no standardized criteria, but then we look at, at the same criteria that we have for the diagnosis of the autoimmune hepatitis, elevated transaminitis, elevation of the IgG, the presence of the antibody, the compatible histopathology, response to corticosteroid, and most exclude lay or typical acute cellular rejection. And this is the problem. Sometimes histology, that is the most powerful tool that we have, cannot tell us that. Um, then how we treat, in, we increase or change the immunosuppressive regimen. Uh, this is just usually confusing when you are looking at the histology. Patients on immunosuppression might not show the most flourished histology. Um, 
And the recurrent disease will increase with time. Then if you have somebody who could have this function 10 years out, you tend to think that it's more recurrent disease. If you have somebody who could have this function in the first six months, you think that it's rejection. Uh, graph loss is significant. Patient needed for second transplant up to 50% of the time. And these are the risk factor. Active disease at the time of the transplant, low level of immunosuppression, younger age, the presence of this HLA type, retransplantation. If the patient was retransplanted because of recurrence, recurrence is most likely to happen. Concomitant autoimmune disorder if the patient have lupus or have any other uh, immune disease, and patient cortical withdrawal. Many centers keep this patient on corticoids forever because they think that it has better outcome. Treatment is low prednisone taper, dual therapy with TACRO and NMF for a longer period of time. The treatment sometimes also is lower calcineurin inhibitor, star steroids uh, with prednisone or entocor. We are using entocor more and more in this patient. We start Imuran or we consider MMF, uh, depending on the age of the patient and the possibility of the patient getting pregnant. Uh, primary sclerosis cholangitis is a progressive inflammatory fibrosis of intrahepatic and extrahepatic bile ducts associated with autoimmune hepatitis and IBD. A very, uh, no, the incidence is 1 in 100,000 in, in adults, only 0.23 in, uh, per 100,000 in pediatric. But can progress to cirrhosis require liver transplantation? We have quite few patients, pediatric patients, uh, that are transplanted because of PSC. And 30, 30% of the patient with PSC will require retransplantation. Then the recurrence of the disease is significant. The diagnosis of PSC before transplant, again, you call recurrent PSC if the patient was transplanted with PSC. Histology, they are going to have an inflammatory infiltrate around the bile ducts. Um, that is the landmark histological for PSC. Uh, ductopenia, fibrous cholangitis, radiological at least 90 days after transplant, they are going to have biliary dilation, as seen here, and they are going to have the beating of the bile dog. This CTs, this MRI and this cholangiogram are of one of my patients that was retransplanted because we thought that she has recurrent PSC. It doesn't get better that, than that for us to say that I have recurrent PSC. In the explant, we found ductopenic rejection. Then again, the lack of having the right diagnosis on this patient. You must exclude vascular complication, exclude anastomotic stricture, and chronic ductopenic rejection. It's easier said than done, because in this patient, despite having all these radiological signs and a liver biopsy that told us that she has recurrent PSC, when we have the whole graph out, she has chronic ductopenic rejection. What are the mechanisms, the mechanisms implicated in the pathogenesis on recurrent PSC? There is a lot in the literature about the activity of the IBD. Then patients that have PSC and IBD are more likely to recur. Um, people thought maybe this patient needs more immunosuppression. And the Pixmore group started using thymoglobulin on this patient. Guess what? They found that patients that have induction with thymoglobulin have more recurrent PSC than patients that didn't. They then don't require more immunosuppression. They might require different immunosuppression or different treatment, but we don't know what is that. High number of rejection episodes, the more rejection they have, the more likely they have recurrent PSC. Older donors, high males, then how we, we do that? Then um, if patients with high males are more likely to recur, then um, there were changes in the UNOS criteria with patients of PSC, if they start having recurrent cholangitis, they were giving points to have a benefit on the list. They don't have to wait until they are very sick to get transplanted because if they get transplanted with high males, they are most likely to recur. And if they have biliary complication. This is actually maybe the only piece of data that we have so far in the pediatric uh, population. Um, we uh, have uh, a pediatric PSC consortium. Then if anybody in the audience has a lot of patients transplanted for PSC, please contact me. We are collecting all these patients. Then we have collected so far close to 1,000. We have more than that now. Patient with PSC period, no transplant. From those patients with PSC, when we have 781, 113 were transplanted, and this is the curve uh, on the left, and then 
the recurrence was in 16 patients. Actually, we now have 25 patients with recurrence. And as you can see um, on your right, the patients that have PSC autoimmune overlap are most likely to record that the patients that have PSC alone. A primary biliary cholangitis is a complex disease uh, with genetic susceptibility and environmental factor characterized by granulomatous destruction of the intrahepatic bile ducts and the presence of antimitochondrial antibody. 10% of patients listed in North America are because of PBC. There are good results after transplant, but about 17 to 46% of the patient record, 30% after 10 years, and is characterized again for high IgM anti mitochondrial antibody, and this presence of the aberrant mitochondrial protein expression in the biliary epithelium. There are good standards for the diagnosis of recurrent PSC. The gold standard for the diagnosis of recurrent PSC is liver biopsy, but it may, be, it may be confused with rejection. Again, we don't know when is rejection, when is recurrent uh, PSC. The risk factor, younger donors and older recipients, and the choice of calcineal inhibitor is Definitely clear that if you are transplanting a patient with PVC, you shouldn't use tacrolimus, you use cyclosporin. They do better with cyclosporin than with tacrolimus. The management, ursodiol or a beta colic acid and the choice of immunosuppressant. Then overall, in summary, patients that get transplanted for autoimmune liver disease, high, a high uh, recurrent index rate, the patient that do the worst, as you can see, close to 60% recurrence is the patient with overlap syndrome. Whether they have overlap autoimmune PVC, autoimmune PSC, those patients do really terrible after transplant, and we need to find the solution for this patient to prevent this from happening. Then the problem is there is no real cr criteria for the diagnosis of recurrent PSC, autoimmune hepatitis on overlap with rejection. Sometimes we think that maybe one trigger the other. If you have rejection that can trigger the recurrent of PSC and they might fire each other. Uh, over immunosuppression most likely will occur when uh, without a clear diagnosis, then we see for our patient with recurrent PSC, they die more frequently of infection, reactivation of EBB, PTLD than any other patient population because most of the time we think that the patient have recurrent, uh, they have rejection, we treat them as rejection, ductopenic rejection, and then they have recurrent PSC that really doesn't require increasing monosuppression and doesn't respond to increasing monosuppression. For the autoimmune hepatitis patient, is a little easier because you increase immunosuppression and most of the time they respond and then you lower the immunosuppression and you have to balance. Um, Immuran or 6MP is good for recurrent autoimmune hepatitis, is good for rejection. Then for the patient with recurrent autoimmune hepatitis is not as bad as it is for the patient with recurrent PSC. They significantly compromise the health of the graft and the life of the patient. Then we decide that this is not no right, and we need to do something about it. We start uh, one project um, that is kind of just in the embryo um, uh, stage, but I want to share you, with you some of the results. Um, we decided this advanced uh, technology that is called high throughput sequence, um, try to study the adaptive T and B cell responses that are implicated in autoimmune disorders and allograft rejection. Then using this technique, of the, we are going to do the um, high throughput sequence of the T cell receptor of the beta chains of the CDR3. This is where the antigens in, get encountered in the cell. Then the antigen presenting cell go through this uh, TC, uh, CDR3. And we are trying to identify and, and decide when we have these clones, wherever we have a reaction, whether it's autoimmune reaction or autoimmune reaction of rejection, we have this clonal expansion. Um, and this is what we see in the biopsy. We see all these lymphocytes in the biopsy, but when they are there, are these autoreactive or alloreactive? And we don't know that. And we hope that with this study, we will be able to determine if the, if the clones is the lymphocytes that we see in the biopsy are autoreactive, and then these are most likely recurrent of the autoimmune disease, or if they are alloreactive, this patient most likely have rejection. Then uh, we have um, 
liver from the uh, rece recipient, and we study the liver very careful, and we try to see what are the clones in that liver. These are clones in the liver uh, that we consider autoreactives. These are the lymphocytes that cause the liver cirrhosis and the liver destruction. And then we have the lymphocytes from the donor and the recipient, and we mix them together, and we see how they react. And the clones that come out of that reaction, we think those are the clones that are alloreactive clones. These are the clones that are regenerated generated when these organs crash, the donor and the recipient. Then how we study this? We do something called um, MLR, uh, mixed lymphocyte reaction, and we do a culture of the donors and the recipient. And when these, um, and we label, the, 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 these clones with these uh, uh, green and violet uh, labels, then colors, when they grow, the ones that are FSC low, when they replicate, it's like when you have a cloth and you wash it and it gets just less intense. When these uh, cells divide, they are like a washing out. And then the, rep in the, rep the replicating cells are the ones that are SFSC low. They have less color. Then we think that these clones in the SFSC low are the clones that are alloreactive. These are the clones responsible for the rejection. The clones that are in the liver are the ones that are autoreactive. And with this concept, we thought that we can figure this out. Then here is our first patient. A 21-year-old female with type 1 autoimmune hepatitis received a transplant from a deceased donor, developed graft dysfunction at nine months. Then everybody thought this is rejection. She has a liver biopsy. The liver biopsy said this is rejection. She was uh, treated with steroids, didn't respond. They thought that she has uh, antibody-mediated rejection. She got plasmapheresis. She got the whole NIR, and still she doesn't respond. When we study her alloreactive and autoreactive clones, what we found is that in these biopsies that we thought that was rejection, there are more of the alloreactive, autoreactive clones than the alloreactive. Then the autoreactive clones are in green, the alloreactive are in blue and red. Then you see these green bars are to the roof in this patient that we thought that have rejection, but the clones that we are finding in that same biopsy that told us that there was rejection are the same clones that were in the native liver, are an, and they are not the clones that replicate when she encounter the donor and the recipient together. Then this is telling us that we got this diagnosis wrong, and this could be what we see in future patients um, with this technology, if we're able to tease out how many clones are there alloreactives and many clones are autoreactive. Then the clinical significance of this is we think that this allows better understanding of the development of the recurrent autoimmune liver disease. We are, will be able to determine the existence of overlap between uh, acute cellular rejection and recurrent autoimmune liver disease, and we this will lead to better therapies, strategies, and improved outcome. One of the questions that we haven't been able to answer is why clones and cells that destroy the native liver are going to attack the transplanted liver that is a totally different genetic makeover. Then this is something that we don't know. We are trying to study these livers in more details. We also think that this technique might be a very good marker of operational tolerance to identify that people that don't react to the donor in this MLR, and maybe we said this patient doesn't need as much immunosuppression. In conclusion, post-transplant management should be personalized. You should consider the theology of the end-stage liver disease. Every time that you are in front of a patient that have allograft dysfunction, the first question that you should ask yourself is what was this patient diagnosed or transplant uh, diagnosed before the transplant, what was the indication for transplant? And I think that this is true for this autoimmune liver disease and relevant to the pediatric population, is true for the recurrent PSC, and is true for the uh, recurrent um, NAFLD. We, as a pediatrician, will see more and more patients transplanted for fatty liver in the future that we have seen today, and we need to be aware of that. Maybe we should move back 
to closer surveillance of this graph. Uh, maybe we need to use protocol liver biopsies as part of the management of this patient. And we are considering that in our autoimmune population. Um, the gap of diagnosed recurrent autoimmune, I don't know if you remember, I said it got from 30 to 70%. Why is that? Then the studies that report 70% recurrence is because this uh, studies did uh, protocol biopsies. And then when you do protocol biopsy, you have a better chance of diagnosing uh, the recurrent of the autoimmune liver disease. And maybe that's the time that you are going to intervene before the patient have progressive disease, mainly for patient with PVC or patient with uh, uh, autoimmune hepatitis, because we have treatment for that. Eventually, I hope that we will become um, more knowledgeable about P uh, PSC and we can develop uh, treatment strategies for that. And then new discoveries are needed. We need new discoveries that support accurate diagnosis and new discoveries that uh, allow us to develop appropriate treatment. This is a very underserved population and, and we should uh, pay attention to them. And then I want to finish this, um, uh, my participation in this beautiful uh, Congress and with these uh, two phrases, sign is simply the word we use to describe a method to organize our curiosity. We are curious by nature, this is why we became doctors, because we are passionate about helping people and we are curious and we want to answer questions. And remember, science never answers a question without creating 10 more. Every time that you think, I got it, you have 10 more questions. And this is uh, my team and, uh, and the grant support um, that we have um, uh, been able to uh, allow us to do this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mercedes. As you've heard, this is a liberating and uh, interesting topic.